in the next minutes I want to focus with you on the computation on some examples of computation of the Greeks for a very simple product that we all know, that is to say the European core, that as usual we will use as a prototype. Now you can imagine that if instead of the call you prefer the put and you are still in the European case, nothing changes, so at the end of the day it's just a matter of signs changing. Uh, if you consider more sophisticated uh, products and derivatives, again the philosophy is the same, so it is more than sufficient for us to just consider the European call. And in analyzing the Greeks for the European call, we will just focus on the delta and the gamma, so the computation of the vega, rho, theta, I'll leave that to you. We will see that computing the delta, uh, we find out that there are a lot of nice symmetries in our uh, computations that allow us to simplify a lot of objects, and we get that, and we get the result of the delta in a very nice short form. So we can say that the delta of a European call can be expressed as the CDF of a standard normal distribution. Now, since the gamma is the second derivative of the price of our object with respect to the underlying price, and in the case of a European call, we are essentially taking the second derivative of the co-value with respect to the price of the underlying asset. Now, the second derivative can be seen as the derivative of the first derivative. So if delta can be expressed in terms of the CDF of a standard normal, you can imagine that gamma can be expressed as the PDF of a standard normal. And this fact immediately shows us that just introducing a very simple object as a European co in a portfolio introduces a non-trivial facet of non-linearity. So, for example, if you have a portfolio that includes a European call, a European put, and all the other things, you can no longer assume the hedge and forget property. So, the, my goal in the next minutes is just to show you that one simple object as a European call can really make your portfolio a non-trivial object to play with in terms of risk management, in terms of hedging strategies, okay? So it's very important to always remember this in financial mathematics. A very small modification, a very small addition of a product to your portfolio can have non-trivial effects, okay? So let's see how we can compute the delta and the gamma of a European from financial mathematics, we know that the value of a European call at time zero is something that we can express as we see on the screen. So it is S times the CDF of a standard normal computed in D1 minus E to the minus R capital T, where capital T is maturity, K, the strike price, uh, phi, capital phi, the CDF of a standard normal computed in D2. Okay, and what we know is that the quantities um, D1 and D2 are defined as you see on your screen. Okay, so these are the standard thing that we recall from our uh, course in financial mathematics. With you, I want to compute the delta and the gamma of our European call. So we will solve together the computation of the delta, and I leave the computation of the gamma to you. But if you want, I can already provide you the solution for the gamma so that you can compare your solution with my solution. And for what concerns the gamma, uh, please notice a difference. The phi you see here is no longer the capital phi, so the CDF of a standard normal, but it's small phi, so it is the PDF of a standard normal, the derivative, the density, as you want to call it. The first thing that I want you to notice is that if I take the derivative of both D1 and D2 with respect to the price of the underlying asset, the result is the same, and it is 1 over S multiplying 1 over sigma the square root of T. This result is very interesting and useful for us.
Now, since we want to compute the delta of our European call, we have to take the derivative of the value of our call with respect to the price of the underlying asset that we call capital S. Now, this capital S appears explicitly in the formula, but also implicitly via D1 and D2, that are the two arguments of the CDFs of the standard normal. Okay, so we have to take into consideration the explicit and implicit presence of S in our call value. Now, this implies that if we want to compute our delta, we just have to uh, observe the following. Now, by taking the derivative with respect to S, the first term that appears is clearly the capital Phi computed in D1 because this is the explicit presence of S in our call value. For what concerns the implicit part, exploiting what we have just said with respect to deriv the derivative of D1 and D2 with respect to the price, we have that we can get 1 over S, 1 over sigma square root of T, multiplying what? S times phi d1, but please notice that this is small phi, so it's the density of a standard normal, minus e to the minus r capital T, k, multiplying small phi d2, okay? And again, here, this is the PDF and not the CDF, okay? So please notice that these two files are the PDF of a standard normal and not the CDF. What we want to show is that actually this term in the brackets, so S phi d1 minus e to the power uh, r capital T k phi d2 is equal to zero. So it disappears so that at the end of the day the delta of our European call is nothing more than capital phi D1. So it corresponds to the CDF of a standard normal computed in D1. Now, if you remember what we said in terms of financial mathematics, this is actually a probability. And do you remember what type of probability we are dealing with? Do you recall the share measure? Do you recall the Wang transform? You see, all these things are highly interconnected. In other words, if you want, the delta of a European call is strongly linked to the moneyness of the option, because you remember that capital Phi D1 is the probability to be in the money at maturity according to the shear measure. And if you want, you can switch to the risk neutral, to the physical, but in any case, this is the moneyness of the option. Working with delta neutrality, in a sense, corresponds to working with moneyness. And this has important implications in terms of both financial mathematics and risk management. To show that the quantity in the brackets is equal to zero, let's start by focusing on the second part, so the part after the minus sign. We can rewrite this quantity, e to the power r capital T k phi d2, and then we can just substitute d2 in terms of d1. So instead of d2, we write d1 minus sigma square root of t. Okay, so this is what we do. Let's just rewrite phi d1 minus sigma square root of t explicitly. So what we get is that we have e to the power minus r capital T k multiplying what? Multiplying 1 over square root of 2 pi, because we are playing with the density of a standard normal, uh, e to the power minus d1 minus sigma square root of t squared over 2. This last term, minus d1 minus sigma square root of t squared, can be expanded and we can collect one exponential in d1 squared and one exponential in the rest. As you can see on your screen, 1 over square root of 2 pi 
exponential of minus d1 squared over 2 can be collected back into small phi d1 because this is nothing more than the uh, density of a standard normal computed in d1. And the other terms can be just rearranged as you see on your screen. Now just permute the first three terms so we can write k phi d1 multiplying exponential of minus r capital T, okay, so we are just rearranging these first three terms, and for what concerns the rest, we just substitute to d1 its actual definition. It means that we will substitute d1 with what? With the logarithm of s over k plus the term r plus sigma square over 2 multiplying capital T, everything divided by sigma square root of t. But d1 in our exponential is multiplied by sigma square root of t, so that part simplifies just immediately. What we get is just what you can observe on your screen, okay? So it's the exponential of the log of s over k plus r capital T plus sigma square over 2 times t, okay? And this is the part in uh, d1. Then we have the last term from the previous equation, that is to say the exponential of minus sigma square over 2 times t. Now what you can easily see is that a lot of terms simplify, okay? So we have that the terms in rt disappears and the terms in sigma square over 2 disappears. What remains is k multiplying uh, phi d1 times the exponential of the log of s over k. But the exponential and the log clearly compensate, so what we get is phi d1 k multiplying s over k. Now k and k simplify, what we get is s phi d1. And s phi d1 is exactly the quantity that we need when we go back to our brackets, to our initial brackets, to observe that s phi d1 minus s phi d1 is exactly equal to zero. So we have proven that this term here is equal to zero, so that our delta is nothing more than capital Phi D1.